Ines very much. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I feel a little bit strange with this thing on. I, I, I usually want to come to Riga, I teach in this classroom, so, so I don't think I need this, but I think I need it for the purpose of, of the recording. So now I, I feel strange because I'm, my mother, when I was born, told me that I had my, my ears too big, right? So, so, so I feel like this is moving all the time, but no, no problem. If, if it, everything just moves around, don't worry. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little bit because I noticed, uh, Inessa, you, you gave me 20 minutes to talk about this. Uh, the rest of the people have 25 minutes or 30 minutes. I don't know why I just I was sanctioned with that, but I, 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 I mean, 20 minutes is okay because it's a, it's a topic that I could fit in in, in 20 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. It's true, but I'm joking. Don't, don't worry, okay? So uh, you, will, you will notice that today in the morning I, I will start talking about this, which is basically uh, a private international law topic, but later, uh, after... After me will come uh, my colleague from Hungary. He's going to address jurisdiction issues. So it's, again, a, a little private international law. So it, it's well-placed. So some people would say you need to talk first about jurisdiction, then applicable law. But, well, we'll do it the other way around. I will talk about applicable law first and, and jurisdiction later. Uh, and this is my, my title, Consumer Protection in the European Union Conflict of Laws uh, Framework. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I, the first thing that I've thought about is, well, mm, consumer protection is very important. We all know this, and we are not going to discuss this. Uh, in the European Union, the consumer protection, let's uh, I say constitutional, because as you know, we, da we don't have anything as constitutional in the European Union. We have something, uh, fundamental principles, etc., but not constitutional. But it's for you to understand that we have some, some important legal basis for uh, consumer protection in, in the European Union, which is Basically, the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, a number of articles there. You check those articles, you will see there that, yes, it is important for the European Union to protect consumers for whatever reasons. And we also have this Article 38 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. But this is one of those articles that you, you know, you wonder what, what is the value of this. Because it says, U Union policies shall ensure a high level of consumer protection. So we could say, hey, thank you very much for telling us in, in, in this article, but I don't see any right here, and I don't see any fundamental right here. It's, it's simply a policy issue. Well, uh, yeah, just because I'm from Spain, uh, I, I just mentioned that in the Spanish con Constitution, we have an article dealing with uh, how public powers need to promote consumer protection, and I guess, I don't know, because I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I guess that other, other constitutions have s this specific background on the protection of, of consumers, which, again, I don't, uh, I don't see, a, at least in the Spanish constitution, this article doesn't deal with fundamental rights. Fundamental rights is another part of the constitution. So do, do we have a fundamental right to be protect those consumers? Well, that's not for me. I'm a commercial lawyer, so uh, constitutional lawyers should discuss about this. Um, uh, the consumer law harmonization in the European Union. Well, this is true. We, we have a strong commitment in the European Union for the protection of, of consumers, and we've done this through s several ways of harmonization with uh, that background in, in the first place. Uh, the background for, for the European Union to participate in this is Again, the same message, internal market promotion. Everything is related to markets and internal market promotion and, and construction, et cetera, et cetera. So when you check uh, the regulations and the rules regarding consumer protection in the European Union, you will always see that message. Oh, we need to, to harmonize this because it's an important tool for the internal market prote protection. And the second uh, reason for the European Union to jump into this is, well, because... They believe, probably we all believe, that consumers deserve protection because they have a weaker economic and legal position via v professionals or businessmen. Well, uh, yesterday, we, I think it was in the last uh, presentation, we have like a discussion debate here about whether uh, if you're a consumer, you're a free person and you, you need to be taught what to do or not, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, but again, some people decided in the past that consumers deserve protection and this should be good, I think, all right? But I, I, I would be open to any other 
positions about this, but let's, let's just start with that, right? Uh, we have two levels of harmonization in the European Union, uh, which the, one, the first one I'm not going to refer to is, uh, well, we harmonize rules dealing with consumer protection through material rules, right? And then we have those, uh, th those harmonization measures that affect only conflict of law rules, which are the ones that I'm going to touch upon. Obviously, material harmonization is basically done through directives. Uh, in directives, you'll find there's two kind of directives, th th those uh, looking for a minimum harmonization, and those which are more recent that, that we look for the full harmonization. Uh, but again, this is something w that we all know. In all European Union member states, we, we implement or transpose directives into our legal, national, domestic legal system, uh, and those rules are part of our legal system and deal with material issues of protection. And in the area of conflict of laws, uh, well, indeed there is a harmonization which has been done, you know, primarily through this legal instrument, regulation Rome 1, and within Rome 1 specifically one article, which is Article 6. Okay, Rome 1 is it's a regulation dealing with the law applicable to contracts, all right? And it's, it covers all kinds of contracts, and specifically, they decided to include this Article 6, which is the one that I'm going to refer to immediately, which is, let's say, the so-called general rule. However, also through those directives we have introduced into our national legal systems, specific conflict of law rules in, 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 in dealing with protection of consumers. So this is what we have here. Let's say Article 6 of Rome 1, dealing on the issue of how to determine the law applicable to a consumer contract. And in addition to that, we have different uh, conflict of law rules uh, in national legal systems, which have been introduced through directives, which also deal with this problem of applicable law. Okay, and, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, what, what Article 6 says, what are the relationships between Article 6 and those directives, etc., etc. Uh, well, uh, in the first place, uh, regarding Article 6, which I told you is a general rule in this, uh, we have a precedent, which is Article 5 of the Rome Convention, so <coughs> that that's sends a message that from since 1980 up to now, we've been doing with this issue of, of, of how to protect, protect consumers from a point of view of the law applicable. Um, th the transition between the Rome Convention and the Rome Regulation mm, has been finally smooth in the end. There was like a proposal to change uh, abruptly uh, Article 5 to, to be more and more and more protective with the consumer. But now when you take a look at Article 5, of the convention, Article 6 of regulation, you will see that the differences are not that big, okay? So that in, in the legislative process, many uh, proposals were just left out, okay? Well, which might be good for some, might be not good for some others. I mean, it depends on, on your policy approach to this issue. But we could say that we are familiar with Article 6 because it's, it's close to Article 5. And the reasons for the change, well, but when, when we, we move on to the regulations, not basically because we wanted to change the contents of the Rome Convention, but it's because of the, what we call here communitarization of private international law, because we needed to have a regulation with, with the contents of the convention. And, well, by the way, because we had to move from a convention to a regulation, we decided to introduce some changes in the regulation Rome 1, and this is very importantly, specifically in order to align the rules on consumers in Brussels and the rules on consumers on Rome 1, okay? So, because both regulations now, Rome 1 and, and the regulation in force now, which is regulation Brussels 1 bis, in this, in this perspective need to be interpreted in, in, in a similar way. Well, mm, let's go to Article 6 and uh, let me tell you something about that article. I'm not going to, to read Article 6 for you. It's, it's a long article, but I hope you understand the, the ideas that are written in that article. Again, it's an article that deals with how to determine the law applicable to consumer contracts. Well, and the first thing here is it's important that not all consumer contracts are covered by Article 6, okay? Only certain types of consumer contracts which are concluded under certain conditions, and those are the ones protected by Article uh, 6 
of the wrong one regulation. Uh, well, what do we mean by certain types of consumer contracts and certain conditions? Well, that information is, is here. Uh, in the first place, there is a specific and restrictive definition or interpretation of what a consumer contract should be. It's all obviously an autonomous interpretation, which is a European Union interpretation, where we find out that this kind of contracts that are covered by Article 6.1 are those where we have a professional and, on the other hand, a natural person acting with a recognizable, objectively non-professional purpose. Obviously, you will not see this in, in Article 6. What I'm telling you is, is the interpretation provided by courts and legal scholars about how to interpret this, this m definition of consumer contract. Uh, and I mentioned here also some small things which might be interesting. For instance, dual contracts, when there is a mix of private and professional purposes, those contracts are usually excluded from the uh, scope of application of Article 6 unless you know the professional use is manifestly marginal okay so if, if you're acting both as a professional as a consumer well usually that's going to be considered a professional contract unless the situation is, is happened well the article 6 requires that for the article to be applicable we need a contract a contract which has been concluded by the parties Again, I mentioned this small detail, you know, the legal scholars in court cases said, well, we don't need a contract in the sense that it requires assumptions of reciprocal obligations. So it's the concept of contract which is, it's is wide in, in that sense. Um, there must be a connection between the contract and the professional's business. Okay, this is mentioned expressly by, by the regulation. And probably this is one of the things which is more uh, limiting in Article 6, and this is an article that basically refers to what uh, they're called passive consumers, not active or mobile consumers, those consumers that move to another uh, country or member state. So the idea is, again, well, consumer protection in, in the field of private international law, applicable law, it all consumer contracts, not some l important limitations, and probably this is one of those uh, of the most important limitations. Also, another big limitation or important limitation is that some contracts are excluded from the scope of application of Article 6.1. And, well, uh, I would focus first on carriage, contracts of carriage and insurance contracts, which are two very important contracts, uh, at least from, from my professional perspective, because I deal with commercial law. Um, Supply of services, not all supply of services are excluded. You, you need to read Article 641 because it excludes a contract for the supply of services where the services are to be supplied to the consumer exclusively in a country other than that in which the consumer has his habitual residence. Okay? Uh, cons uh, contracts related to rights in RAM or related to a tenancy of an immovable property. This is the usual type of contract which is always excluded or has specific rules in the European Union regulations. And financial instruments or uh, contracts concluded at a financial market. So you read Article 6.4, you will see a more uh, precise definition of those, of those exclusions. I would say, well, uh, those contracts related to financial instruments or concluded at a financial market, well, uh, you know, the financial world is it's tough, it's difficult. It's, uh, so why? Is the consumer excluded for, uh, in, you know, in those situations? Maybe because the consumer is not a usual party to those contracts. The only exclusion there which is uh, really strange, it's carriage. I mean, uh, I, I'm, 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 I have expertise on, on shipping law and, and transportation law, and I always figure out what, I mean, with, what is there specific to carriage that makes that contract to be excluded from the scope of obligation of this article, which deals with the protection of consumers, because we are all uh, consumers when we take a plane or we take other means transportation. And I, I can tell you stories about uh, how many times I flew to Riga and I got my baggage lost. Last time in the winter time, that was a great story that I came here, no luggage, I have to teach for a week, I only had my, you know, everything that I had on. So I needed, I said, well, what I do? I went to a shop here and buy it. I had to buy shirt and then shirt and trousers and things. Well, we, we are fighting constantly with, so 
carriage is not covered. Some people say, well, carriage is not covered because uh, carriage contracts have a specific protection in international conventions, for instance, Montreal Convention dealing with uh, air carriage, or there are regulations in the European Union, but it's still, I mean, still it's, it's, it's something which, uh, because that's a contract which is very much related to consumers. I'm not talking about, obviously, commercial carriage. So, well, this is, this is it. This is an Article 6 which deals with consumer contracts, but <coughs> obviously a lot of consumer contracts, but it's still not all consumer contracts. And what is the specific conflict of law rule which is applicable when this article uh, enters into play? Well, that's the, let's say, the general uh, conflict of law rule. Uh, the law applicable will be the law of the country of habitual residence of the consumer, which might make sense. By the way, it's interesting. Habitual residence is it something that has to be defined as a de facto matter. Because we have a definition of habitual residence in Article 19 of the, of the regulation, but it's not applicable here because that's an apply to consumers. So this is, the, let's say, the basic rule. It will, we will apply the law of the country of habitual residence. Can we choose the law applicable? So that's the second rule. Choice of law is admitted, but within the limits of the mandatory provisions of the law of the country of consumers' habitual residence. So the choice of law is... Uh, Someone could say it's limited. Well, it's not limited, only if you choose the law of a specific country, you need to take into consideration what the rules on the law of the country of habitual residence say about that. So this is the problem here, because we need to make a comparison, and, and not in the abstract, but specifically and applicable to that case, we need to make a comparison between the legal systems the one chosen when there is a choice and the legal of, of the, the country of habitual residence. And this is something that has to be made in the end by the judge, ex officio, ex sua sponte, and usually through this preferential approach, which means, well, the judge will need to think which national law leads to a more consumer-friendly outcome. I mean, imagine this, if you are a judge, I'm not a judge, and I don't want to be a judge in my life. It's, I, it's a very complicated profession. But you imagine you're a judge there. You have thousands of cases uh, in a year, and now you have to sit down, relax, and, and, and have a whiskey with you and, and, and a drink and think about, oh, I need to compare. Because they chose the law of China, protecting consumers, and, and but the consumer is resident in Spain, so which law is more protective. It is the law of China, it's the law of, what are the, what are the mandatory rules in the law of, of, of Spain to be, well, I don't see judges doing this. I have a high respect of judges, but I don't see them doing this. I mean, the way it should be done, and the way legal scholars taught the judge to do this, because they don't have time. And it's a complicated matter, right, to, to understand the law chosen is the law of that country, how do I know exactly the degree of protection in that other legal system. How do I compare that with the law of the country of vitro residence? So complicated thing. And one final thing here is no other law applicable options are available here. So it's either the first one, law of the country of vitro residence, or the second one, the chosen one, with limitations. There's, for instance, no possibility of escape clause in this in this article like we have in let's say in article 4 the Rome 1 regulation well but i told you in addition to article 6 we have also in the european union legal system some special or specific rules uh, which are conflict of law rules or, or something that look like a conflict of law and this is the list of directives some of one of those directives is already uh you know not enforced the, the one in 97 but uh, again all those Directives in the articles that I mentioned there for you to check at home when you, you need to you need to do that <laughs> now, right? But if you check those articles, in those articles, in those directives that deal basically with material issues, you will find out something that looks like a conflict of law rules dealing with consumer protection. And well, this is an example of what you're going to find in those articles. It's it's I, I took it from one of the specific directives, but. There's one directed that says the member states shall take the measures needed to ensure that the consumer does not lose the protection granted by this directive by virtue of the choice of the law of a non-member 
country as the law applicable to the contract if the latter has close connection with the territory of one or more member, member states. So that does, that's the usual wording that you're going to find in the, in the directives. I here say a former example because in this directive from 2011, finally they decided not to mess anymore with this topic. They didn't give us a conflict of law rule. They simply said in a recital, this, this directive should be without prejudice to regulation, but wrong one. So probably this is a message that, I mean, this is too complicated. We, st we have Article 6, which is a complicated article, and now we have eight more conflict of law rules in directives, and, and well, in 2011 they said, oh, 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 there's something called wrong one, and it looks like it's a good thing. So probably we're not going to provide any more conflict of law rules in, in, in our directives. We'll see. Because, I mean, this is, a, I say, a new example, but you know the European Union goes up and down, goes right, left, uh, you never know what, where they go. So maybe they change again their principles. Um, well, let me just to, to go on and, and finish. Some comments on, on this, uh, this situation. Obviously, there is a problematic whole existence between Article 6, Roman 1 and other European Union rules. Some people even discuss about the suitability of directives as a means to harmonize the member states' private international law. Okay, so that's a topic for discussion here, there, and everywhere. Some also say, do, do we really need directive-based conflict of law rules? It's not just simply if the directive is a suitable source, but do we need those? Uh, this is, the, I, I quote this because I took it from this fantastic guide on Rome 1 regulation, which is my Bible for, the, for teaching. And they call islands of P. IL private international protection. It is true. I mean, depending on how the directive is implemented, sometimes you feel that, well, the, the Austrian island is much better for consumers than the Hungarian island or for the Spanish island. You, you never know, right? So they call about islands of PLI protection. And th this is a curiosity because if you notice before I said here, that the consumer does not lose the protection given by this direct by virtue of the choice of the law of a non-member country. Some scholars have said that the law of a non-member state or country, uh, at least for some, should include the law of a member state that has not transposed the directive, and I could say even uh, appropriately, uh, appropriately, all right? So we still have this discussion. This is not simply we transposed, but we transposed this in the right way, because if we didn't do it in the right way, then we are considering this to be the law of a non-member state. Okay, this is interesting. Um, a solution between this class and Article 6 on one side and, and the conflict of law rules in, in directives. We have Article 30, 23 of the Rome 1 regulation that deals with the relationship with other provisions of community law and basically says that this regulation shall not prejudice the application of those other provisions. So that, that's an article that might apply to a situation. Well, we have Article 6, but we have conflict of laws in the rest of the directives and, and, and the transpose uh, domestic rules. So here it says clearly that those provisions prevail over Article 6. But again, we, we have a problem with interpretation of Article 23 with the recital 40 of Rome 1, which deals with Article 23. Uh, look at the, the first line. The first line of our recital says, a situation where conflict of law rules are dispersed among several instruments, this is the case here, and where there are differences between those rules should be avoided. So that's, that should be the principle basis of action in the European Union. I mean, we should avoid that we have more than one conflict of law applicable to a specific topic. However, the regulation covers the possibility of having those specific rules, but again, within this context, provisions designed to contribute to the proper functioning of the internal market. Again, you know, the internal market is, is a big principle here. So what do we do uh, when we check Article 23 and we try to organize the relationship between Article 6 and the conflict of law rules in the, in the directives? Well, we start with the lex specialis, the Roga generalis rule. So it's, it's, if there is a conflict of law in a directive, 
that's Lex Specialis, so it prevails over the Article 6. I, I understand that, and I, I accept that. But uh, yeah, it, it covers both primary and secondary European Union instruments, regulations, and, and directive. Um, this idea is very important, because I think it's a common idea here that the primacy of other European Union law provisions presupposes their legal nature as conflict of law rules for contractual relations in a material and functional sense. So this is something interesting. Read, read the articles on the directives dealing with this topic, like the one, the example that I gave you. Uh, read the articles in the National Transport Legislation. Do those articles look like a conflict of law rule? I know I, th this is a theoretical problem dealing with, with uh, you know, uh, private international, but are they conflict of law rules or something like that? And finally, well, the terms provision of community law excludes not claim five establishment. So I have to finish. Well, critical comments. Are domestic rules implemented directives to be considered provisions of community, community law? Some people doubt about that, but majority affirmative. The prevalence of conflict of laws domestic rules under this article should be limited to the situation where the domestic rule introduced in implementation of the directive faithfully reproduces the content of the directive. So if we don't do it right, okay, we have a problem. And finally, this is one particular approach that I, I read from a couple of professors from here in, 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 in North and Estonia. Uh, it's, it's interesting, but I don't think it's I mean, correct according to the text. But they said that the implementing rules, I mean, those in the directives, should be considered only after it has been established that the requirements for application of Article 6 of Rome 1 have not been met. I think this is going too far. And finally, uh, if you want to check all the Rome 1 rules to be considered here, Focus on 3.4, Article 9, and Article 4.3. And basic conclusions, I have to finish because uh, someone will cut my throat. Um, my first conclusion, which is in, in, in the sense of a question, are specific conflict of law rules necessary here? So you answer yes or no. It's, it's your position. Rome 1 regulation covers many different possibilities of protection. I feel that if you read Rome 1, not all the Article 6, but all the articles that I mentioned, you, you could cover mostly everything there. And finally, should Article 6, Rome 1 be developed or complemented or implemented? Well, I know that's also a question for discussion. So I'm done. Okay, thank you very much for your, I'll take questions with a drink.